Hi, welcome back to the channel. This video is another update on the situation with regards to Russia. And we're looking predominantly at the economic impacts of the war that is going on right now in Ukraine. And they are wide and varied. But in this video, I want to talk about banking. And banking is something that we've covered a lot on this channel. And the exposure of the international banks to Russia is quite significant. Some banks have actual operations in Russia. They've got branches and networks and customers. And other banks have been getting involved in lending to Russian companies and general exposure to the Russian economy. So I wanted to go through the details in this video because obviously there is a large cash exposure. But there's also the business question. And I've been asked quite a lot recently about the companies that have announced that they are pulling out of Russia. So we've heard from BP and Shell and some of the other multinational companies that they are exiting all of their operations. So they're essentially just upping sticks and going home. And a lot of people have been asking me, how does that actually work in practice? How do you just walk away from a business? So I guess if you've got a small entity, it's relatively straightforward. You just make everybody redundant. You write off all of your investments and then you just close down that operation. But it's not quite as easy as that if you're a bank because a bank has a lot of people who rely upon it. So you can't just stop operating your bank because there are millions of people who are depending upon these institutions. So it's a lot more complicated to close down a banking operation. So I wanted to go through some of that. But in this video today, the things that I'm going to look at, I've got a really interesting table from the Bank of International Settlements, which shows the exposure to Russia by country. Then we'll delve a bit deeper into some of the banks who've got networks in Russia, and we'll look at which banks have the biggest exposures and are potentially looking at writing off billions of dollars over the next few Few months. We'll then have a look at the rating agencies who've come out and changed their perspective with regards to Russia and they've actually released a statement about banking and what the risks are attaching to the current crisis. And then we'll look at a couple of Russian banks that have operations in Europe. So these are Russian banks that have bought European operators and they now have networks of customers outside of Russia who are dependent upon them and we'll have a look at what's happening with that and then finally today I'll wrap up with my summary as to what I think is likely to happen here and what I think the implications of all of these issues on banking are going to be for the global economy over the next three to six months. So before we get into all of that as always I'm going to ask you for a thumbs up if you're liking the content of this video please smash that like button and also if you haven't subscribed yet uh, please do so because I'd really appreciate it. And finally, I just wanted to point out that I always include chapters in these videos. So if there's a particular section you're not that interested in, it's really easy to skip over it and move on to the next topic. This table was produced by the Bank of International Settlements and it shows the total exposure on the residents of Russia from all of the different countries around the world. And this table was put together as at the end of September. So the figures actually could be a lot larger now, but these are the only reliable numbers that we have at the moment. So if we look at the column on the far left here, it shows the total amount of claims against Russia. So you can see that the total at the top is 121.5 billion US dollars as at the end of September. Now, if we scan down the table, we can see that the two countries with the largest single exposure are France and Italy. And we'll go into some detail on that in a minute. But the reason that they have the biggest exposure is that two of their biggest banks have networks in Russia. So they actually own banks in Russia. So they have customers and corporate customers and lots and lots of loans. The country with the next biggest exposure is Austria at 17.5 billion. And again, the reason for that is that one of the major Austrian banks has a Russian subsidiary. If we look all the way down to the bottom of the table, you can see that the country with the fourth largest exposure is the USA. And that is predominantly because Citibank has operations in Russia. 
Now, normally I would spend some time going through the separate columns here and looking at when these loans are due for repayment and all of the other details. But I think given the current status of what's going on right now in Russia, most of the banks are looking to exit from their exposures. So in the same way as we've seen with all of the corporates, I think the Western world is looking to cut all of its ties with Russia. So it's quite likely here that we will see a mass exodus of all of these banks out of Russia. Now, how they do that in practice remains to be seen, but I think the likeliest option is that they will probably be looking for Russia to take their exposure off their hand or to step in and to manage these networks of branches that they have in place. So let's move on and talk about some of the specific banks who have big exposure in Russia right now. Socgen, or Société Générale, is the third largest bank in France, and it is the institution that has the biggest single exposure to Russia. And the reason for that is that it owns a Russian bank called Rosbank. Now, Socgen has been operating in Russia for a long period of time. It opened its first office in 1973, and in 1993, it decided that it wanted to create its own branch network, and that was when Rosbank was first founded. Rosbank is now a fully-fledged bank. It has 13,000 staff and over 5 million customers in Russia. As well as its consumer banking division, it also has a large corporate presence and has over 78,000 small business customers and 9,000 large corporate customers. Sokgen's current exposure to Russia through Rosbank is around about $20 billion, which equates to about 3% of the total assets of Sokgen as a business. Now, nobody really knows what's going to happen with regards to these banking assets, but Sokgen themselves have actually come out and made a statement that they believe that they could end up having all of these assets stripped away from them by the Russian authorities. Because of the sanctions that have been put in place against Russian banks and financial institutions, Russia is retaliating and there is a real likelihood that the Russian authorities may decide to just remove all of these assets and move them into state ownership. And if that happens, obviously, Sokgen would have to write off the full amount of their $20 billion exposure. Unicredit is the second largest bank in Italy and has an exposure to Russia of around about $16 billion. The business currently has 70 branches in Russia that operate under the Unicredit brand and is ranked as the 14th largest bank in Russia by assets. Unicredit has a long-standing history in Russia, having opened its first branch in 1989, and the Russian exposure represents around about 3.7% of the total Unicredit group. Rifusen Bank is the second largest bank in Austria and has 130 branches and 3 million customers in Russia. A city bank has been trading in Russia for over 25 years and is ranked as being the 19th largest bank by assets. It trades under the name Citibank and has over 500,000 retail clients and 3,000 corporate customers. Now, rather interestingly, back in September 2021, Citibank's official return showed that they had $5.5 billion of exposure in Russia. Now, they've just updated that figure, and they're now showing that they have around about $10 billion of exposure. So they can't have doubled their exposure in such a short space of time. They must have just been under-declaring the amount of loans and exposure that they had back in September. And now that they know that there's issues in Russia, they've updated all the figures and included everything. So a $10 billion exposure for Citibank is quite significant. It's relatively small in the context of the City Group, but it's still a major issue for them. And another interesting thing to note about City's situation is that they've been trying to sell their business. And they actually had a bid, and there was only one bidder in town, and that bidder is the Russian bank VTB. But unfortunately, VTB is one of the institutions that's now been hit with sanctions. So VTB are no longer allowed to use SWIFT, they're no longer allowed to raise capital in the international markets, and they certainly won't be allowed to buy Citibank's operations in Russia. 
So the sanctions have killed the only chance that Citibank had of selling their overseas operation in Russia. And it looks like now they're going to have to close it down along with all of the other institutions. And we don't know the details on how they'll do that. But a $10 billion hit is going to hurt Citibank at some point soon. So the rating agencies have now come out with an updated rating for Russia. And as usual with the rating agencies, there tends to be a delay between what's happening in the real world and what's happening with regards to their ratings. So they've come out and reduced the status of Russia's debt to junk bond status. So they're now at the point where they're sitting just above default. I think it's likely that they will move to default at some point in the future. But both Fitch and Moody's for the time being have just got it sitting at junk level. Fitch recently published an update on the Western Bank's exposure to Russia. And you can see in this paper that they're estimating that the total exposure is $91 billion at the end of September. Now, that's about $30 billion less than the chart that I just showed you. Now, interestingly, on the Fitch analysis here, it's showing that $41 billion of that exposure relates to local positions in local currencies. So that's essentially the subsidiary banks that we've just been talking about, where international banks have actual operations in Russia. And that means that the other $50 billion relates to international loans. So these are loans that are being put together either by syndicates of banks or individual banks directly to Russian companies. Another interesting point from this paper is that the estimated total exposure to Ukrainian counterparts is around about 9 billion US dollars. So significantly smaller than the exposure to Russia. Spurbank, one of the largest Russian banks, has announced that it is now pulling out of the rest of Europe. So we touched on Spurbank in a recent video. This bank has been hit with sanctions. So it can no longer access the international markets. It can't raise any more debt. It can't raise bonds. And it also can't make any payments using SWIFT. Now, the business currently has 187 branches spread across eight different countries of Europe. And I touched on this recently that the customers of these branches were forming queues around the block. Everybody was trying to withdraw their money and there were restrictions in terms of the amount of cash that each customer was allowed to withdraw. The last official filing that ShareBank made showed that the business had around about $15 billion of assets and the majority of those assets will be customer deposits. So these will be normal people living in countries like the Czech Republic, Croatia and Hungary who are going about their normal everyday lives and now all of a sudden because of the invasion of Ukraine their bank is closing down and the assets are potentially likely to be frozen. They certainly can't withdraw all of their money. So all their money is now sitting in a bank that is being closed down. And that's a very stressful time if you're a private individual. And although there are individual deposit schemes in every country that protect savers, there's usually a limit on that. So generally it sits at around about 50 to 100,000 euros or 50 to 100,000 dollars. And so if you've got a large amount of savings in these banks, any money above those limits is now potentially at risk. You could lose your life savings. So it gives you a real world example of how something that's happening in Ukraine that you would think has no relevance to your life all of a sudden can be a really big problem for you if you by chance have your savings with Spurbank. And most of these people didn't plan to bank with a Russian bank. It was just that their local bank was taken over by Spurbank around about 10 years ago. And so they had Russian ownership. So really big problem for a lot of these people in all these different countries. Through no fault of their own, they could lose a lot of money. They could lose most of their life savings if Spurbank does go bust and it doesn't have the cash to be able to return all of these deposits to all of the customers. Now, an interesting point to note from Spurbank's recent announcement is although they're closing down all their European operations, the one area that they're not closing down is their Swiss banking operation. Now, Swiss banking, if you're not familiar with it, is traditionally the country where very, very wealthy people 
store all of their assets. And it's generally a very low tax or no tax regime. And it's also very secretive. So you can have a Swiss bank account. Nobody really knows the details. And Swiss banks don't have to declare all the information to anybody about what's going on with that customer. So interesting that Sberbank is keeping its Swiss banking operations because I'm sure there are a lot of very wealthy Russians who are sitting with large amounts of cash in Switzerland, hoping that nobody goes along and seizes those assets. We're hearing a lot in the press at the moment about various countries looking to seize assets from Russian oligarchs and very wealthy Russians. And the Swiss bank accounts will be a major cash prize if somebody could get their hands on those. But unfortunately, because of the rules in Switzerland, I don't think that anybody is going to be stealing any of the cash from the Swiss bank accounts anytime soon. So Spurbank keeping its Swiss banking operations just to keep all the oligarchs happy. And I'm sure President Putin may well have his own little bank account with Spurbank in Switzerland. VT is one of the other major Russian banks that is now subject to sanctions. So in the same way as we talked about for Spurbank, VTB can no longer access the international markets, can't make any SWIFT payments, effectively has been closed down outside of Russia. And VTB has significant operations outside of Russia. So the information here shows that VTB is operating predominantly in three main countries outside of Russia, which are Austria, where it has $2.9 billion worth of deposits, Germany, where it has $1.7 billion, and France, where it has $1.6 billion. And the rest of Europe, where it has a variety of offices, the assets are $4.8 billion. So the total value of all of these assets across Europe is around about $11 billion. Now, since the sanctions were imposed, the regulators have been looking at VTB and are potentially about to announce at any point in the next couple of days that they will be closing down VTB's operations outside of Russia. Now, this is a major cause for concern for a lot of individuals and also some local authorities. In Germany, VTB has been very popular with savers because it was offering really good interest rates. And it's reported that a lot of the local authorities in Germany have placed large deposits with VTB. So if the bank is closed down by the regulator, it remains to be seen how much cash is actually still within the bank, whether or not VTB has 11 billion in assets right now, or whether some of that money has been repatriated back to Russia, because if it has, then people with their deposits with these banks won't receive back all of their money. And the deposit protection scheme in Germany is capped at 100,000 euros. So if you're a local authority who's deposited a million euros or maybe more than that, then you've got a lot of your cash at risk right now. So I'll keep you posted on what happens with VTB, but I think it is quite likely that the bank will be shut down by the regulators and then we will see the fallout amongst all of these customers. But again, there'll be some very nervous people sitting, trying to get their money out and finding that it's absolutely impossible because these banks have been completely frozen. So what's the summary and conclusion today? Well, really what I wanted to highlight in today's video is how widespread the impact of the invasion of Ukraine is going to be across all different levels of society. So I've talked today about the banks, and obviously banks will have exposure to every country around the world. So if there's military conflict, or we see geopolitical risk or change of government, then that always puts those loans at risk. But when you've got a situation like this, where banks actually own subsidiaries in Russia, then all of the money that they've lent within Russia is at risk. If Russia suddenly decides as a retaliation tactic that it wants to seize control of all of the international banks in Russia, then nobody's going to be able to stop them doing that. And all of that money is potentially gone. It will be lost forever by the overseas banks. But it's not just the financial institutions who are suffering here. There are people and companies all across Europe who've been giving their money and their savings to these banks to hold on their behalf. And if VTB and Spurbank do get closed down and do go bust, or it turns out that they're insolvent because a lot of the money isn't actually sitting in Europe, it's been moved back to Russia, 
then all of those customers potentially could lose most of their life savings. So it shows you a real life example of how this can impact on anybody. Most of the people who are banking with these Russian institutions didn't choose them because they wanted to bank with a Russian entity. They did it because it's their local bank that they've probably been banking with for the whole of their life. Now, the fact that it was taken over by a Russian corporate 10 years ago meant nothing to them at the time, but could mean quite a lot to them going forward. So really worrying time for anybody who's got their money in these banks. And it shows the level of impact that a conflict like this can have on anybody around the world. But the bigger picture story today is all about how much is at risk in the international finance markets. And I showed you a table earlier that around about $120 billion is sitting out there at the moment in terms of exposure to Russia. Now, there is a real possibility that the whole of that $120 billion could be wiped out. We might see all of those loans being lost and no recovery whatsoever. So we're looking at a potential $120 billion black hole in the financial world. And as you'll know if you follow this channel, that won't be the end of it because there's always a domino effect. So that 120 will mean that a lot of institutions and financial bodies around the world won't receive in an amount of cash that they were due. That will then probably mean that they won't be able to make some of their payments. And so the ripple effect will start to increase that amount. And it could be that the global impact of 120 billion loss in Russia actually is amplified five or six times. So that figure could increase to somewhere between 500 and 750 billion dollars. So when you look at it in that context, you can start understanding why everybody's concerned about what the impact of this conflict is going to be on the global economy. And this is just the banking side of it. I've talked in other videos about what's happening with companies and international trade and imports and exports and the price of oil and the price of food. So this is just another factor on top of all of those other factors. And that's why I think there is a real risk here that what's going on in Ukraine right now could cause a global financial crisis because every single factor that we're looking at is negative. There's no positives coming out of this conflict. It's only going to be negative. It's only going to mean that people are losing money in various places. And as you start losing more money, it has that domino effect and it could definitely cause a recession at some point during 2022. So hopefully you've liked what I've said today. Maybe you haven't liked the content, but you've liked the structure of it and what I'm actually telling you. Nobody wants to hear the bad news, but I think it's always good to know exactly what's going on and to be as fully informed as possible. If you have liked what I've said today, then please give me that thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't done so already.